Okay, now we need to have a serious talk. When I post videos about practical tips to help you work toward awakening or pitfalls to avoid, it's almost inevitable someone will make a comment uh, along the following lines. When I describe liberation or when others describe liberation, they will also say that it is just simply the way of things, meaning it's not caused and it's not causal and there's no one in it. It's just reality as it is, things as they are. It's everything and nothing and it's pristine, perfect. It has no flaws or errors. Even the appearance of separation, which is ultimately an illusion, is just part of the perfection and it's perfectly okay. So, why would I give people practical tips about awakening? Why do you have to work toward it? Why is effort valuable? Doesn't it just cause the seeker to believe it's going to find a way out of its own suffering and thus prolong its own suffering? So if this comment or concern or question comes from a place of understanding, of insight, then that's great. The person is not necessarily wrong. They're just not completely right. What I mean by this is that this view, if held rigidly, is mistaking the absolute perspective or the liberated perspective for true liberation. It means we are at some level attempting to abide in the state that was realized and cut ourselves off from the suffering of the world. And this can happen for a while. It's not even something you do, it's just what happens. And it's wonderful if you can spend years of your life in liberation, which of course isn't like that. There's no one in liberation, there's just liberation. Without going back into suffering at all, without feeling the suffering yourself again as a no-self, without any filters, without being able to filter, push it away or divide it out, then great. But at some point, it's going to happen. You're not even going to be able to differentiate enlightenment from suffering anymore. And this is a very subtle fixation. But you see it in some teachers who can only hold the enlightened perspective, can only hold the absolute perspective. Energetically speaking, there's still a bit of an avoidance to vulnerability. There's a really wonderful saying I've heard before about the bodhisattva. The bodhisattva is someone who is not quite a Buddha because there's still a very subtle fixation on compassion, true compassion, waking people up, helping people wake up. But if you were to ask the bodhisattva where they will spend the next lifetime, where they will be reborn, they would say in hell because that's where the most help is needed. So I can address this on a couple of levels. One is from personal experience, while it is true that there is no perception of any aspect of self, in fact, perception itself was an aspect of self, perception apart from the perceived disappears, seen to be an illusion. Awareness of is seen to be an illusion. Any form of self with a small s or a big S, a personal or impersonal self, universal consciousness or universal awareness is dissolved. That's the dissolution of a subtle sense of self. From this place, nothing needs to be said. Nothing needs to be done. No one needs to be woken up. There's no preference at all. There's no preference for life or death. Now this may sound cold, but it's not. In the moment, it's quite intimate. It's infinitely adaptable and fluid and deeply peaceful. So that is my experience. It is part of my experience. When I say my, I mean that in a conventional way. But there's another part of my experience I can't deny, and that is there are no boundaries. So if someone in front of my face is suffering, and they know they're suffering, and they're relating their suffering, I can't draw a dividing line between the realized knowing that there's no one there and the person who very much feels like a sense of a person suffering. I can't do that anymore. It doesn't work. There's no way to do it. It's just seen to be not the case. So I become that suffering person in that moment. I am that suffering person. There's no need to end suffering anymore. There's no one who needs to end suffering anymore. 
and thus suffering is perfectly allowed. So it's perfectly felt. So from there, I can't deny that that person perceives a way out of suffering. They feel the fuel of that suffering moving them toward realization, liberation, awakening, toward living truth. And I am that movement with them. So I can't deny that and say, well, there's no one that's going to do that. And, you know, that's a cop out. On my part, that would be a cop out. If it feels authentic to express that way by others, then fine. I'm not saying that's wrong. But for me, it would be a cop out. Because I'm also that suffering person. I am their point of view. I am the mind identification and the suffocating thoughts. And I can suffocate with them again and again and again. I can die over and over and over because there's no one not to do that. Because there's no one resisting that. That's the deeper meaning and understanding of no self. So this is why I give practical information about awakening, why I give cautions about what not to do or how to avoid the pitfalls. Because I am that person waking up again and again and again. This is called not abiding in the state you've realized. The Xin Xin Ming points very clearly to this. It's one of the best pieces of liturgy you'll find. I highly recommend it. A Zen master named Dogen who lived hundreds of years ago very succinctly describes and addresses this. It's the first couple of paragraphs in his work called the Fukang Zazengi. I'll read those here for you. The way is basically perfect and all pervading. How could it be contingent upon practice and realization? The Dharma vehicle is free and untrammeled. What need is there for concentrated effort? Indeed, the whole body is far beyond the world's dust. Who could believe in a means to brush it clean? It is never apart from one, right where one is. What is the use of going off here and there to practice? And yet, if there is the slightest discrepancy, the way is as distant as heaven from earth. If the least like or dislike arises, the mind is lost in confusion. Suppose one gains pride of understanding and inflates one's own enlightenment, glimpsing the wisdom that runs through all things, attaining the way and clarifying the mind, raising an aspiration to escalate the very sky. One is making the initial partial excursions about the frontiers, but is still somewhat deficient in the vital way of total emancipation. Need I mention the Buddha, who is possessed of inborn knowledge? The influence of his six years of upright sitting is noticeable still. Or Bodhidharma's transmission of the mind seal, the fame of his nine years of wall sitting, is celebrated to this day. Since this was the case with the saints of old, how can we today dispense with negotiation of the way? You should therefore cease from practice based on intellectual understanding pursuing words and following after speech, and learn the backward step to turn your light inwardly to illuminate yourself. Body and mind of themselves will drop away, and your original face will be manifest. If you want to attain suchness, you should practice suchness without delay. So we pretty much hit the nail on the head there with this issue. You could call this where absolute meets relative. So the first portion of the process of liberation, starting with awakening and culminating in the experience of the dissolution of all boundaries and the dissolution of the world, the self and objects, as well as a deep, all pervasive equanimity. That's just the absolute aspect. From here, there's another kind of beginning and you may be able to abide in the absolute for a while. You may even teach from there maybe even for the rest of this lifetime. And if you can do that, wonderful. In a sense, it's the highest achievement. But it does go beyond that. It does evolve beyond that. There's another piece of Buddhist liturgy that addresses this called Tozan's Five Ranks. And his first three ranks really address this part of the process. Awakening through liberation, through no self-realization. The third rank is called coming from within the absolute. So this is the absolute perspective, absolute teaching. But he goes on to describe a fourth and fifth rank. And the fifth one is called unity attained. Here's his description. If you are not trapped in being or non-being, who can dare to join you? Everyone wants to leave the ordinary current. 
But in the final analysis, you come back and sit in the ashes. So I'm here to sit in the ashes with you. And that means wherever you are, wherever you're coming from, I tell you it's not the perfected perspective because there's still a sense of self or seeking or doership. If those experiences are there, that's fine. We'll proceed from there. You have to start where you are. You have to continue from where you are. You have to enter presence from where you are. You have to know the self through experiencing the self right where you are. And that's the only way the self will ever really drop away.